communication, uh, uh, global communication through rock and roll, through music, which I still have great belief in. Diplomatic Corps. Mr. Washington Cecil, the Bridges Philippine Honorary Chairman. Mr. Jaime Augusto Zobel de Ayala, the Bridges Philippine Chairman. ADB President, Mr. Haruhiko Kuroda. Members of the AIM Board of Governors and Board of Trustees. AIM President, Francis Estrada and Dean Victoria Licuanan our friends from the International Peace Foundation, distinguished guests from the government, international development organizations, business community, academe, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We welcome you to the Bridges Dialogues towards a culture of peace. My name is Phil Alfonso and I will be your host and moderator this afternoon. May I now call on AIM President Francis Estrada to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Phil. Indeed, uh, distinguished guests and friends, excellencies, and members of the AIM community. We are privileged to have with us today someone whose reputation truly precedes him, Mr. James Wolfenson. A former president of the World Bank, Mr. Wolfenson is an investment banker turned spokesman for the world's poor. Turning on its head the commonly held belief that this is a profession of heartless and occasionally mindless people. After years of dealing with global financial crises, Mr. Mr. Wolfenson focused the World Bank on that most intractable of divides, poverty. Under his watch, the World Bank became the largest external financier for primary education, health, HIV AIDS programs, the environment, and biodiversity. In 1995, Mr. Wolfenson led a very important and ultimately successful initiative seeking debt relief for the poorest countries in the world. Together with the IMF, he led the bank in drawing up a list of highly indebted poor countries and working out the criteria 
for giving aid in coordination with the International Monetary Fund. He championed the cause of good governance. He emphasized the relationship between good governance, poverty reduction, and development. In his words, thoughts and sentiments that resonate strongly in our region, and I quote, corruption is a core poverty issue, robbing from the poor the little that they have. Another thought, what use the law book if the judges are corrupt, if the poorest and most vulnerable ex can expect only brutality from the police? And another quote, what use the privatization if there are no social safety nets to deal with the unemployment, nor rules to protect the public from private monopoly. Asia, as we know, is the world's largest potential market with a population in excess of 3.7 billion. It has a sizable and well-educated middle class, as well as a motivated and highly trainable workforce. Since 1998, Asia's GDP has doubled. Exports have grown to a fifth of the world's total, and the region now holds over two-thirds of global international reserves. Despite the recent turbulence in the international financial markets, the World Bank still projects emerging East Asia to grow by 8.2% this year. However, for all its vaunted success, about half of Asia's people remain poor. The rural-urban divide can be seen in practically all Asian countries. These challenges make Mr. Wilkinson subject today beyond East-West, North-South peace and prosperity in a four-speed world, especially relevant to us. The Asian Institute of Management is honored to have our guest of honor with us this week as we celebrate our 40th anniversary. From inception, AIM was committed to training capable, principled, and socially responsible managers and leaders for Asia. It is difficult to think of an individual that embodies this vision more than Mr. James Wolfenson, truly a man for all seasons. On behalf of the Asian Institute of Management, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Francis. To tell us more about Bridges, may I call on Mr. Jaime Augusto Zobel de Ayala, Bridges Philippine Chairman. Mr. Washington CSIP, Mr. Jose Quisia, Mr. Francis Estrada, members of the Board of Governors and Board of Trustees, Dean Victoria Licuana, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and delighted to be with all of you here today. It's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome you all to this fourth in a series of lectures in this ASEAN-wide event entitled Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of peace. We're certainly pleased to be holding this Bridges event here today at the Asian Institute of Management, the first graduate school of management in Asia, and now proudly serving its 40th year in service. Throughout the years, AIM has helped shape the face of Asia, educating over 35,000 professional managers and entrepreneurs in over 70 countries around the world. It is certainly fitting for us to be here today to listen to how this world is changing on a day-by-day -day basis. The Bridges series is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including the country's major universities from November 2007 to April 2008 and Bridges is being continuously held in the Philippines and Thailand, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, 
physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. This would not have been possible without the vision and untiring efforts of Mr. Uwe Morowitz, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation. Uwe, if you don't mind standing up. Uh, for conceptualizing and bringing to reality the Bridges program for us here in the Philippines. It is mainly through his efforts that the Nobel laureates have come together and agreed to engage in lectures and conversations in ASEAN, which already illustrates the power of international cooperation within ASEAN and to the rest of the world to bring together a program of this quality to all of us. The topics of the ongoing events deal with the overall theme of building a culture of peace and development in a globalized world. It covers a wide range of issues in the fields of politics, economy, science, culture, and the media. They especially highlight the challenges of both globalization and regionalism and its impact on development and international cooperation. Over the next two months of this program, different Nobel laureates will visit the country separately to conduct public lectures, seminars, workshops, and dialogues hosted by educational institutions in Manila, Cebu, and Davao. This intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace provides an opportunity for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. A pluralistic approach ensures that different groups in our divided world can act in a highly interdependent manner to understand and help solve societal challenges. In our first three meetings of this series, we focused on economics and physics. While one may look at these topics as relevance, as mere coincidences to the challenges that face us today, I interpret them as a testament to both the timeliness and timelessness of the key messages they represent and to the brilliance of the speakers who present them. In our first lecture with economist Robert Mundell on fitting globalization into the national development strategy, he spoke about optimum currency areas and a policy framework for economic stability under fixed and flexible exchange rates, topics obviously of great interest today in the face of foreign exchange volatility. In our second lecture, physicist David Gross spoke of science's contribution to building up our stock of knowledge in the world and the way in which, work, and the way in which it works. More intriguingly, he described science as flourishing within and reinforcing systems of political and social freedoms because scientific discovery is based on empiricism, openness, transparency, and questioning. Presenting a scientific view of the world's environmental condition, he even questioned the economic paradigm of growth, positing that perhaps our present and future leaders should reconsider the strategy for development, an unquestionably contrarian view to those engaged in running countries or businesses, but fascinating nonetheless. A third meeting brought us back to the field of economics, where Dr. Finn Kidlin spoke about how deficient economic development often gets in the way of peace. He illustrated the two cases, that of Argentina and Ireland, and pointed out how policy inconsistencies in one case led to lack of credibility among investors, even during periods of high growth, and argued that credible and forward-looking policies could have dynamic effects on the economies of poor countries. In today's meeting, our fourth in the series, our guest of honor will speak about peace and prosperity in a four-speed world. We have no doubt that his thoughts will enlighten us in new and unexpected ways. We'd like to thank you all for attending this program. May it help us to facilitate a culture of peace and development through dialogue. And in this spirit, we welcome all of you here to learn about peace and prosperity in a four-speed world. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Jaime. May I now call on the country director of the World Bank in Manila, Mr. Bert Hoffman, to introduce our keynote speaker. All right. I usually have to do that in Asia. Uh, Mr. Estrada, Mr. Ayala, and Mr. Sisip, um, members of the Board of Governors of AIM, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, magandang hapong po. Good afternoon to you all. It, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Mr. James D. Wolf, the speaker here today, to this distinguished audience in the venerable Asia Institute of Management. James Wolfenson is one of these rare men for whom it is almost easier to list the things he did not do in his life and career rather than the things he did do. 
I think you can best describe him as a modern day universal man, a homo universalis. Uh, a lawyer by training, a highly successful banker and founder of his own investment bank, a philanthropist, an Olympic sportsman, guardian of the arts, broker of the peace, and helmsman, helmsman of development, also an accomplished cellist, an honorary knight of the crown of England, and much, much more. For me personally, though, Mr. Wolfensen is the man that transformed the World Bank, and I think he transformed the development debate. In his exceptional two terms at the helm of the institution, he opened, up to the bank, he opened up the bank to its many critics from the left and the right, and he turned many of them, not all of them, but many of them, into strong development partners. He changed countries from the subject matter of technocratic policies into clients that needed to be supported in finding their own solutions to their development problems. He moved the bank from a Washington-based and most of the time Washington-centric organization to a very decentralized organization where the country teams in the field enjoy large discretion in choosing the way to serve their clients. He also turned the intractable debt problem, and Mr. Strada talked about it, he also turned the intractable debt problem of some of the poorest countries into the world uh, into a manageable process leading to debt relief that allowed those countries a second chance for development success. And with the comprehensive development framework that he launched in 1997, he promoted a broader concept of development that went well beyond increases in material well-being that used to be the sole compass for success for the bank and for development economics. And to, just to illustrate how significant that was, my previous three years I spent in China, and China's harmonious society, which is now the, the banner of their development, model is inspired by the Comprehensive Development Framework launched by Jim Wolfenson in 1997. In my personal view, though, the most important contribution of Wolfenson to the bank and to the development debate, and one that is highly relevant for the Philippines today, is that he made the issue of corruption debatable within the World Bank and in the development community. Through his Cancer of Corruption speech of 1996, Wolfenson ignited a, 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 a a heavy and open debate about the damage that corruption does to development and to poverty alleviation. With that, he paved the way for a pragmatic approach to corruption and created the space for his staff, including me and others, to address the challenge of weak governance to the benefit of the world's poor. Since leaving the World Bank, Mr. Wolfenson has not stopped working for development. On the contrary, Apart from his work in the Gaza Strip and his advisory role for the development community at large, he funded a development institution at Brookings in Washington, which has become one of the big centers of thinking about development in the world, and staffed by some very smart former world bankers as well as others. Today's speech is further evidence that development is still his passion, and that he is a man to, th to think beyond the standard paradigms in addressing the challenges of development. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Jim Wolfenson. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after that excessive introduction, I think I should go home before you hear me, because it'll be downhill from here. Uh, let me first uh, acknowledge and thank Mr. Estrada and my friend uh, Jaime Ayala uh, Bert Holman, and uh, uh, particularly if I could acknowledge the presence here of Washington Cecil, who has been for me a, a friend and a guide for a very long time, and someone whom uh, I have the very highest regard and who is more than just a representative of this country. He is truly a man for the world, and I'm very honored that you're here, Wash. Uh, and I thank you for being here. Uh, the subject that uh, I have been asked to talk about and which resonates uh, with my current interest is the issue of how our world is changing uh, from the world that I grew up in and looking around the room that some others at least also grew up in uh, and uh, how, in fact, uh, we really need to take a forward look at uh, new issues that are confronting us. Uh, as I look back on the 
50 odd years in which I was engaged in development, starting as I did in Australia. I recognized uh, when I look at Brian Scott, and we were both thinking about what we should do when we grew up, that I, I at least immediately thought that I'd better go and try and find out something about Asia. And not having any money, I thought, could I get a scholarship to go study somewhere in Asia? There were no scholarships to go somewhere in Asia. The only one that I found was in Hokkaido University, where there was a school of Commonwealth studies. And um, I was too late to get that. Uh, even if I had applied, I probably wouldn't have gotten it. But the truth of the matter was that I then uh, had, uh, like some other four people in this room, had to go to Harvard instead uh, and, and uh, do the best I could with that primitive education. Uh, but it didn't stop my interest in Asia, and it didn't stop my interest in development. In fact, it awakened it as I had the good fortune to meet representatives of a number of those countries uh, in, um, in, in that work. But what I became aware of was that all of us who were looking at the world were looking at it in, in a way that really was not sustainable. As you know, it was uh, for many years a world of around six billion people. Uh, a billion in the OECD countries and the so-called rich countries. And then there were five billion people out there somewhere in the developing world. And they had more or less 20% of the world's income. And the billion people had more or less 80% of the world's income. And if you wanted to get anything serious done, it was with uh, the United States and the OECD countries and the G7. And uh, the organization of the world was really built around uh, what uh, those countries in Europe and in North America would do uh, in relation to this developing world. I see in front of me some distinguished members of the Philippine administration in the past, but I think uh, there was a sort of patronizing atmosphere in, in those early days. I recall uh, our friend Toyu Gyoten, whom I think you knew very well, and who, as a Japanese uh, government official, uh, commented in 1964, and I quote him, he said, I still remember vividly the day I went to a meeting of the Bank for International Settlements in Basel as an observer. It was the year of the Cultural Revolution was sweeping China. Red card were rampaging the air. It was of high concern to neighboring Asian countries. But at the meeting of the BIS, central bankers from all the European countries and the United States were gathered, had cocktails, luncheons, and dinners, and talked endlessly about gold, the dollar, pound sterling, switching endlessly from English, French, and German. There was absolutely no interest in the upheavals in China. The Vietnam War was at a critical stage. But apparently the bankers had little interest in such events. I thought uneasily the world seemed still to end somewhere near the Dardanelles. And in fact, that was true. There was this sort of egocentric view of the world with the economic power uh, residing in the historic countries of Europe and the United States. Indeed, as people came to visit the United States too, there was a feeling uh, that uh, you know all the all the modernity was coming uh, from the United States and from Europe. And I remember in a book by Robert Kagan, A Dangerous Nation, uh, a quote from a young group of Meiji reformers who came from Japan in 1960. And he quoted, he said, they came back impressed by American science and technology, marveling at everything from railroads and weaponry to gas lights and flushing toilets. This was all in 1960. It seems preposterous today as Japan has the bullet train, but it's not all that long ago. And this was the era, in fact, in which I grew up and in which I was trying very hard to recognize and to anticipate the changes that were happening on our planet. The economic changes, I'm sure you're aware of, but just to remind you how recent it is, in terms of the share of global GDP, 
Asia in uh, 1991 was 7.8%. By uh, 07 today, the countries of this region are maybe 15%. But the projections are, the projections are that come 2050, uh, the role of the developing world, which is now 20%, will in fact be over 60%. This is not just some modest change in the way the world operates. This is a tectonic shift in terms of how we look at our world. And of course, it will be a world not of six billion people. It'll be a world of nine billion people. Of the next three billion people to come onto the planet, maybe a hundred million that go to the so-called rich countries as we know them today. The other 2.9 billion go to the developing world. So we'll have a world, give or take, of 9 billion people, of whom there'll be a billion, maybe 100 million, in the countries of the G24. And there'll be, give or take, 8 billion in the rest of the world. And this poses us with an extraordinary challenge in terms of understanding what are the shifts that are going on around us when people educated in the way that I was educated, and I'm sure some in this room were educated, to think, what are the changes that are occurring? How can we adjust to it? The first thing which uh, is interesting for bankers particularly, is how the wealth of the world has changed even in the last decade. Uh, I was reminded of some of the work that I did in this country uh, some years ago, and in the region in general, and we were sort of putting out fires at that time in the region in general, even in China. Today, as we look at the global resources, we have around $5,000 billion in foreign exchange reserves, of which 60% are in Asia, 60% in Asia. China rests today at $1.3 trillion, $1,300 billion. And talking the other day to the governor of the central bank, he told me that conservatively they'll get another 300 billion this year. So that will be 1.6 billion dollars, and that's excluding Hong Kong, uh, which they have a little side package of a couple of hundred billion dollars. Uh, this is a different world, a different world where the United States is under 100 billion dollars and ranks, I think, something like in terms of the powers of the world, uh, in terms of its access to foreign exchange reserves. That's a different world than the world of 50 years ago. It's a different world than the world of 10 years ago. And it's changing with dramatic speed, with which you in the Philippines have a very good chance of looking because they are near neighbors that are bringing about these dramatic changes. The truth is that in the year 1500 and in the year 1840, China and India were 50% of the global GDP. They went down by 1940 to around 5, 6% of global GDP. But the truth is they're on the way back. And they're on the way back in massive and challenging force, not just to the established countries in uh, the European and Asian and American environment, but also massively challenging other countries, including yours, in this part of the world, largely because of their enormous uh, educational activities, of their manufacturing capabilities, and their tremendous penetration of markets around the world. I'm happy to see uh, in the analysis that I've done the last couple of days that the Philippines is still hanging in there in a number of very interesting ways, and in particular in technology. But disappointed to find this morning, uh, and it is this morning as I got the National Statistic called Coordination Board's report, that poverty uh, in this country, they're on the way back. And they're on the way back in massive and challenging force not just to the established countries in uh, the European and Asian and American environment, 
but also massively challenging other countries, including yours, in this part of the world, largely because of their enormous uh, educational activities, of their manufacturing capabilities, and their tremendous penetration of markets around the world. I'm happy to see in the analysis that I've done the last couple of days that the Philippines is still hanging in there in a number of very interesting ways, and in particular in technology. But disappointed to find this morning, uh, and it is this morning as I got the National Statistic called Coordination Board's report, the poverty uh, in this country which I had thought had been diminished, as I look at the figures of this morning, the poverty incidence in 2000 was 33%. 2003, 30%, 2006, 32.9%. And that, of course, uh, for me as a former World Banker, is a challenging uh, statistic uh, to place before you, uh, as uh, this is a country where I think you know the difference uh, between rich and poor, the so-called Gini coefficient, is as high as it is almost anywhere in the world. It's a challenge, but one that I'm sure you'll be able to confront, particularly after the debates that I've been exposed to in the last 48 hours about the governance in this country. I have no doubt that central to that is going to be the issue of equity and social justice in the country, and important uh, indeed it is. But what also is happening in India and China is that these countries are developing really massive middle classes. Uh, the estimates for 2025 are extraordinary. In China, we're talking about 600 million people that will live between $13,000 and $50,000 a year. In India, which as you know, lags China, started later in its economic development, uh, the people that live between ten and hundred thousand dollars will be five hundred and eighty-three million people. This is a billion one hundred million people in a middle class. A billion one hundred million in two countries. <clears throat> and for those of you that travel in those countries, you can you can feel the change that is going on, and also the management challenges that are attendant to it to try and see how the countries can do this in a peaceful uh, manner. And uh, I'm happy that the president of the Asian Development Bank is here uh, today because uh, perhaps in some future lecture he can tell you how all this can be done uh, as i sitting in the second row there and a, a former colleague and a, a great friend whom you're lucky to have in the community. So it is that we have uh, now in Asia four billion people in 30% of the world's land mass uh, that will grow significantly by at least a billion and a half in this next period. But there is another part of the world which uh, is doing less well, uh, which is Africa, a continent of a billion people, which in that same period of time will grow to maybe two and a half billion people. It'll be 25% of the world's population by 2050. But the growth rates and the level of uh, economic advance are trivial compared to what I've described in relation to China and India. And yet with two to two and a quarter, two and a half billion people, this is not something that can be ignored. It's also not an Africa that I encountered 50 years ago, uh, where there were people uh, in mud huts, as you imagined it, uh, a long way away from information and knowledge. Today, as you travel through Africa, or even in the country areas, there are people with earpieces, there are wind-up radios, there is uh, a strong uh, environment of information flow, and a sense, uh, unfortunately also, of those who wish to bring about a bad result in society who are engaging people in Africa uh, to help disrupt not only things in the 50-odd countries that are there, but also in other parts of the world. 
And so we must not just forget Africa, not because it's a challenge, it is also a very remarkable opportunity. And there too we're seeing differences because what is happening in Africa is that, as you will have seen in the last two years, it is India and China that are now taking a lead. The last meeting of the, globe, of the African heads of states was held in Beijing. I've been to many of those meetings before in my earlier capacity. The notion that it would result in an invitation from Beijing and that's where the meetings were being held and the next meeting will be held is something that would have seemed to me in the realm of fantasy a decade ago. Uh, but it is now something that I believe will be established at the same time that happened. 400 African businessmen went to New Delhi and $10 billion worth of business was contracted at that meeting. And for those of you that travel in Africa, there is hardly an African country that doesn't have a town hall or a sports stadium or some such thing built by Chinese. And if, as I got involved with a friend in an African country in a modest real estate development and I went down to visit him, when we went up country to see him, uh, there were 20 Chinese there who were doing the development. Uh, it is a remarkable change in terms of the way our world is looking. And so we come to face our world in a, in, a, in a very different way than we have before. It's no longer just the rich countries and the poor countries. It's now uh, divided in, in ways that are really quite different uh, than they were uh, when I was growing up, when it was just rich and poor. Today we're looking at what I call the four-speed world. It's a world in which, to understand the world, you have to look at it in different ways. Of course, there is the group of leading countries, the so-called billion uh, that I spoke of before, that already have a pretty well-established um, standard of living. Then there are the what I referred to as the globalizers. Now that's the Indias and the Chinas and a group of countries, some 20 of them, that have more than a 3.5% growth per annum and which are headed to really quite substantial uh, GDPs per capita. I remind you that China is operating at a bit over 10% growth per annum and India at maybe 8% growth per, per annum now. There's a little bit of argument about the statistics, but they're up in that sort of region. While the rest of the world, including, by the way, the United States, uh, is languishing at somewhere around 1% uh, this year, maybe a little bit more. It uh, depends on what is likely to happen as a consequence of the existing financial challenges that that country is facing. And we're looking then at a and just leaving it at that level, at a G7, uh, which is no longer the traditional G7. Uh, it is a G7 which was brought home to me uh, some six years ago when I was at the G7 meeting in Lyon. And uh, it was the first time that uh, uh, the, the President Chirac, on behalf of the leaders, had invited uh, the Chinese Premier, the Indian Prime Minister, the Brazilian leader, uh, the leader of Nigeria, and Thabo Mbeki from South Africa. And this was their concession uh, to the New World. Uh, they were invited for lunch, and before lunch, uh, at 11 o'clock, they were each given eight minutes to speak. <laughs> and so they had flown in from wherever they were, and they gave their eight minutes. And starting with China, Hu Jintao spoke, uh, then the then Prime Minister of India spoke, and then the newly elected uh, President of Brazil rose to his feet and said to them, um, I'm interested in talking to you, and I'm very proud because my parents had no money and I went to uh, a very primitive education system. I became a union leader and now I am president of the great country of Brazil and I'm very happy to be here. Indeed, I'm honored. I only wish my parents could have seen it. He said, but I'd like to make a suggestion to you gentlemen sitting in this beautiful place overlooking the lake. Um, maybe next year you should have your meeting in 
Brazil or in China or in India because you need to get used to it because in another 15 years, the five of you won't be here. Uh, and, and in 20 years, the leading country uh, will be China. Uh, we'll still have the United States number two. Uh, we'll have India number three. We'll have Japan number four. And then in whatever order he gave it, you will then have Brazil, uh, Mexico, and number 10 will be Vietnam. And, and uh, just so that it's not too big a shock, I suggest that you might want to start coming and meeting in our countries because you've got to get used to the food and the language. Uh, and, and I thought that was a pretty gutsy thing to say. Uh, and of course, everybody laughed. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that that is the way that our planet is going. And it's exactly that issue that I think uh, is important uh, for this audience to understand and indeed for all of us to understand as we go to the, the next two levels, having talked first about the leading countries that I said were the OECD countries, then the Indias and Chinas, which are coming along and growing at more than 3.5% a year. Then there's a group of countries which we which are called by the technicians the rentier countries. And they're countries that are, have a standard of living of around $4,000 per capita, uh, and actually between 875 and 14,600, just to be academically correct. Uh, and these are countries which will grow at less than 3.5% a year. Not a bad way to live, of course. They represent a billion 300 million people, a number of Arab countries are amongst them, a number of countries in this region are amongst them. And then there are the laggards, as they're called. The laggard countries are roughly a billion people today, uh, which will be growing significantly because, as you know, uh, the countries in, in my goodness, must be President Bush calling. Uh, uh, I'll tell him that I've been speaking nicely about the United States. Uh, um, uh, the laggard countries uh, will grow and they will have uh, in another uh, 25 or 30 years time a doubled population. And the question that I think those countries and that we face is still the issue of poverty. Uh, we are not, uh, and hearing your statistics this morning, we're not doing a very good job of poverty. Uh, there are those in China and India who will not make the cut in terms of middle class. And they're not just a few of them, they're hundreds of millions of them. Uh, there are also a couple of billion uh, coming through in Africa for whom the future is not a dream. Or if it is a dream, it's not a great dream uh, because of what they have learned in the past. And then we also have within countries not just between countries. There are significant differences between, in the case of China, the coastal areas and the central areas, in the case of India, the agricultural areas and the cities. Uh, they vary between country where these internal divisions occur. But it is not time to relax on the question of poverty uh, because it's still there. And while there is a, a growing uh, character in terms of uh, the importance of, of uh, development in these countries. We're still finding that the opportunities for poor people are not as great as, as, uh, as I think we would all hope and expect that they might be. And that leads me to two really significant issues. The issues are first the issue of inequity, or the issue of poverty, and the second not unrelated issue, which is the issue of environment. For those of you that have been in the environment business or have taken an interest in it, there is just no doubt that poverty and development in poverty countries does lead to environmental degradation. This is not a trivial issue just for the elite who are concerned about environment. This is a hard-edged economic issue uh, because the impact of environmental degradation is immediate and, and significant in terms of economic development. And so we are confronted then with this new perception of the world 
uh, of of a uh, of a world which has within it a very large number of people where equity and social justice is one aspect but where significantly the issue of the environment in which we live is another inequality and environmental degradation become two hugely important issues and as I said, they're not just between countries, they're also within countries. The other thing that I think uh, we need to understand is that it is no longer just people who have been in the poverty business who are now taking an interest in this subject. In this region of the world, you have had with your regional organizations a very, very significant change in terms of the issues of poverty maybe partly because of the Asian Development Bank, but not alone. The IAA work plan, which is a plan from June, July 2002 to June 2008, has, as I'm told, 107 projects in infrastructure, human resource development, information and communications, and regional economic integration. And it is addressing the question of poverty and development not as a matter of charity, but as a matter of enlightened self-interest. Unless this region deals with the question of poverty, uh, I'm not foreshadowing uh, political turmoil, but the truth of the matter is that if you have a young population that can't get jobs and there has no opportunity, and today they are able to see what the opportunities are in other countries, they become dissatisfied as any one of us would become dissatisfied. So the combination of more information and the recognition that in many parts of the world this issue is being confronted and rewarded for people who are young is putting significant pressure on this region. And I'm happy to say that the region has come together at the Asian ministerials, at the IAA conference, uh, to really focus on the issue. And it's not just the regions. If you take a look at China and India, uh, they are each reaching out to try and see first what they can do in regard to their internal populations and how they can bring about economic activities uh, that will reward a greater portion of their population. I think many of you know in this part of the world who have focused on the 16th uh, Party Congress in China that the first thing that they came out with in terms of their statements was an issue on two major themes. One was poverty and the other is the environment. This is not just for show. Uh, at the Congress uh, that they uh, presented their programs, uh, they came out clearly and said the population and environmental problems are worsening. This was the starting statement. And they then went on to say a large portion of the population find the national situation in employment, social safety nets, income distribution, education, medical care, housing, occupational safety, and public order to be seriously deficient. This is not the view of a commentator. <laughs> this is a statement by the people on the committee. And so we are seeing now, I think, a recognition perhaps belatedly, but nonetheless effectively, that should guide us all. It is that we cannot just think of our own economic advances, which are considerable in the middle class and the upper middle class, but that if we're going to enjoy the benefits of the lives that we now have, we cannot forget, as we've never been able to forget, two or three billion people who need to be brought along. And I must tell you, having worked in the field for 10 years, this is a very hard sell. Uh, people broadly don't give a damn if they're, if they're well off. I've given speeches, I don't know how many speeches in the course of the last 14 years. And they generally run, gee, that was a good speech. Uh, you get about an hour. Uh, they tell you over a drink that it's pretty interesting. 
Uh, and you get in the car and drive off to the next beach, and the people that you've talked to get in the car, drive back to their offices or homes, and within a very short period of time, maybe after a dinner table conversation, if you're lucky, uh, what you said is forgotten. I say that to you not because I think I'm a forgotten person or that I'm feeling insecure, both of which I feel, uh, but because the issues that I'm addressing are not theoretical issues. They're not issues that we can just forget. They're the issues that are going to determine the lives of our kids. They're the issues that are going to determine whether they live in peace, whether they live in harmony, whether they have real futures. They're issues which affect the way they'll be able to look at themselves in terms of a moral approach, in terms of a humanitarian approach, and in terms of a self-interested approach. They just need to understand better you know, what the challenges are uh, that are coming, notwithstanding a billion, 300 million people being taken to middle class in China and India, when we still have two to three billion people and that will be living in poverty. This is not something you can put under the mat. It's not something that's theoretical. It's not something that can be forgotten. And it's for that reason that I was very happy and grateful for the opportunity to come and talk because I think these issues need to be addressed. And I think they need to be addressed not just from the point of view of an interesting economic argument, but because for your children, they will be the issues that will determine the sort of lives that they live. I thank you all for the opportunity of speaking. Thank you, Mr. Wolfenson. May I invite you to take the center lounge seat as I call on the next speaker. Our first reactor for this afternoon is the President and Chief Executive Officer of FINMA, Inc., President and Vice Chairman of Bacnotan Consolidated Industries, two affiliated companies with investments in housing, education, energy, and financial services. He served as the Philippines Secretary of Finance under President Fidel Ramos, who is present with us here this afternoon. From 1992 to 1993. In 1978, he was awarded as one of the 10 outstanding young men in the field of investment banking and finance. He is currently the chairman of the Makati Business Club, the Philippine Business for Education, the business community's response to the need for consensus and sustained advocacy in education reform. He is also a member of the AIM Board of Trustees and the Chairman of the Board of Advisors of the AIM Ambassador Ramon V. De Rosario Sr. Center for Corporate Responsibility. May I call on Mr. Ramon R. De Rosario Jr. to give his reaction. President Ramos, Mr. Washington Sisip, Mr. Joey Quisha, Mr. Francis Estrada, Mr. Jaime Augusto Sobel, Mr. Wolfenson, thank you very much, Mr. Wolfenson. It is a pleasure to have the opportunity to react to your uh, piece this afternoon. It is heartening to note that three years after leaving the World Bank, Mr. Wolfenson has not diminished in his passion for finding solutions to the problems of global poverty. I believe I am not exaggerating when I say that for many of us here in the Philippines and in the developing world, Mr. Wolfenson's continues to be the face that we associate with the World Bank. This is a result, I believe, not only of the length of time that he served with the bank, but also of the clarity of his vision and the passion and intensity, and I might add the charm that he brought to the job that helped make the World Bank a more relevant institution 
to many developing countries, including the Philippines. In the decade that Mr. Wolfenson served as World Bank President, our world achieved significant progress, not only in promoting sustained growth, but more importantly, in uplifting the lives of the poor in many parts of the globe. But many, as he aptly points out, have also been left behind. It has been almost a year since Mr. Wolfenson wrote his op-ed piece about his inspired hypothesis of a four-speed world. And his words ring truer today as we face the challenge not only of subprime mortgage failures and the threat of global recession, but perhaps even more critically for the world's poor, the possibility of spiraling inflation in the prices of basic commodities and food in particular. As Mr. Wolfenson points out, the world's economies, while becoming more interconnected thanks to tremendous strides in telecommunications technology, are also fragmenting and growing further apart. In a worldwide economic slowdown, the laggards regrettably tend to fall further behind. In Mr. Wolfenson's view, the dichotomy between the North and the South divide and the East and West twain has given way to four economic groupings that move at distinct velocities. These are the tier one, steady growing high income economies, tier two, rapid growing middle income economies, tier three, erratic growing emergent economies, and lastly, the tier four, stagnant growth, low income economies. In highlighting these distinctions, Mr. Wolfenson has emphasized the interdependence among these four cycles, circles, and the need for concerted action on the part of global economic leaders to uplift the conditions of the poor in tier three and four countries. But the assistance programs of the developed world will have very little impact if these are not complemented by genuine efforts on the part of host countries to achieve sustainable growth and development. And speaking from the viewpoint of one who dwells in a tier three volatile economy that has the patent means and resources to climb to tier two status, but somehow remains held back. It is not only policy that matters, governance is equally important if we are to achieve sustained development. In fact, I would say that there is really no choice but for the two to go hand in hand. Good governance places the country in a position to adopt the best economic and social policies that will promote genuine development. And poor governance ultimately leads to poor policies and poor spending choices that limit the avenues for the poor to improve themselves. One of the functions that Mr. Wolfenson in his model would assign to the ASEAN economies, such as the Philippines, is to light the path by which the impoverished countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, can rise above their vicious cycle of economic stagnation, widespread hunger, social unrest, internecine bloody conflicts, and environmental degradation. Our intended role is to offer hope by being shining examples of the success that can be achieved in terms of economic progress and social stability. While not shrinking from this all-important role, I am afraid that some countries in this third category, the Philippines included, is not ready, are not ready to be one of the beacons of hope for the destitute economies of the world. I speak in particular of the Philippines and I speak from the perspectives of a private sector business executive. I fear that we would set a less than ideal example. For unless our country comes together to finally slay the hydra of government corruption that has tormented the Philippines' political economy for so long, then I fear that the recent economic progress that we have seen will not be sustained. It is not merely a four-speed world. National economies, if steered improperly, can in fact swerve off the road and into the ditch of stagnant growth. What matters just as well is who is in the driver's seat. Corrupt government officials, because of conflicting self-interest, will take the wrong turns and select the wrong paths at the expense of national interest. For instance, they will create state projects and programs that serve to funnel tax money that should go to the poor 
into their pockets with little or no regard for these projects' ultimate benefits to the national welfare or the reduction of poverty. Civil society and private sector groups, including the Makati Business Club, have been criticized for meddling with government affairs. We business persons face an ethical and professional dilemma. When the economy is humming along and business prospects appear bright, do we speak out or stay silent in the name of stability and continued quote-unquote progress? When confronted with credible testimonies of widespread and outrageous corruption, but it only appears a dilemma when one looks at the situation from a short-term point of view. Over the longer run, extensive corruption will put the brakes on the economy's development and progress. In the long run, it is a culture of integrity, truth, and accountability that will serve us well. And using the words of Mr. Wolfenson, this is precisely why we must all give a damn. Corruption at the highest levels of government poses a major obstruction to the national economy's development. Corruption tends to subvert and destroy the very institutions that would sustain economic progress. For full economic development to take place, a country must first develop the economic, social, political, and legal institutions by which the government and society in general will interact and bring about this momentous change. Institution building, can take a generation or more. But what takes a generation to build, corruption can tear down very quickly. Corruption creates economic distortions and inefficiencies by undermining the government's processes of project evaluation and approvals and diverting public investments towards high-ticket, uneconomic projects with huge kickbacks by favoring the well-connected select few, by raising the costs of doing business, and by raising the risk of broken contractual agreements. Third speed countries such as the Philippines can thus fall back into fourth speed stagnation if we do not take care to cleanse our political systems of widespread corruption. In our quest to do so, civil society and the business sector cannot, cannot be rightly accused of being backseat drivers. Rather, we function as the car's navigator who sits beside the driver, befitting our crucial role as determinants of the optimum route to take. Once a country embarks on its journey towards economic development and higher speed growth, political stability becomes a governing requisite. In order to achieve this